Oh, good evening. You know, after this morning's lesson, I was like, I don't even need to preach tonight. Aaron did such a great job, by the way. If you didn't, if you weren't here this morning or you didn't get to watch it on the live stream this morning, then make sure you do. That really was a great lesson, uh, but I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try tonight. Oh, go ahead and open up your Bible, please. John chapter 11. John chapter 11, that's where we're gonna be studying from this evening. And while you're turning there, uh, let me just say that I really like that Aaron sang that last song, Wonderful Story of Love. Because, I mean, that's really what the Bible is all about, isn't it? I mean, the Bible is all about the fact that God loves people, right? And we see that from the very beginning. From the very beginning, from page one, when God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, God didn't create the heavens and the earth so that he could dwell with the plants and the flowers and the trees. God didn't create the heavens and the earth so that he could dwell with the birds of the skies or the fish that's in the sea. God didn't uh, create the heavens and the earth so that he could dwell with the animals that, that walk on the land or so that he could dwell with the sun and the moon and the stars or the light and the darkness or the seas and the land. God created the heavens and the earth so that he could dwell with people because God loves people. And so we see as the story progresses in the Bible that even when mankind screws up, I mean, just messes everything up, God still puts this plan into motion to redeem humanity. Why? Because God loves people. And in the book of Hosea, when his people mess up and they cheat on him, essentially, he still says, I'm going to take you back. Why? Because God loves people. And that story continues in the New Testament. Whenever we read the Gospels, when God, he comes in the flesh. And whenever we see him, Jesus, looking out at Jerusalem, and, it's, and the text says that he felt compassion because they were like sheep without a shepherd. See, God loves people. And Paul makes that clear, by the way, in the book of Philippians, when he talks about how Christ, how he left heaven and he took the form of a man and he died as a bondservant. Why? Because God loves people. And that's clear throughout the Gospels. And I think that's, that's most clear, at least in my opinion, in the Gospel of John, right? We see love all over the place. John 3 and verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but has everlasting life. God loves people. And we see it in John chapter 13, when Jesus is talking to the disciples and he says, I give you this new, com uh, this new commandment. That you love one another just as I have loved you. So you should love one another. And so Jesus tells the disciples, you guys have got to be like family. You have to have love for one another. Why? Because it started with me. Because I loved you. And then he said the same thing in John chapter 15 and verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. Again, God loves people. And I think we see this the clearest in John chapter 11. In John chapter 11, I think this is the biggest example in the gospel of John, or at least the second biggest example in the gospel of John of Jesus's love for people. In the context, Lazarus, he has died. And Jesus, he sees sort of the torment that death brings to, to his friends, to his family, to Mary and Martha. He sees how death has plagued humanity. And the text says in John 11 and verse 35, Jesus wept. And so the Jews respond by saying, see how he loved him. So uh, John 11, one of the, the big things that John 11 shows us is, is the love of Jesus. And I think there are a, a couple of lessons, a few lessons about the love of Jesus that we learned from John chapter 11. So that's what we're going to talk about this evening. We're, we're going to talk about some of the things that we learn about Jesus's love from John chapter 11. Let me give you one. Let me give you one. First of all, Jesus's love is not what we always expect. So we're going to pick up in John chapter 11 and verse 1. John 11 and verse 1. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, uh, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. 
It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the son of God may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, well, let us go to Judea again. Let us go to Bethany, essentially. And so what we see here in these first seven verses or so is we see something surprising, at least in my opinion, because Jesus in these first uh, uh, couple, first seven verses or so, he's told by Mary and Martha, hey, Lazarus is sick. Lazarus, the man who you love is sick. And the idea is Lazarus is sick and he's going to die. And even though Mary and Martha in, in the text don't tell Jesus, you need to come now. That's the idea. Lazarus, whom you love, is sick. So come on. And then we're told in verse 5, and this is where it gets a little confusing or maybe surprising. We're told in verse 5, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister Lazarus. So what would you expect at this point? You know, we're, we're, we're told that the, the sisters call out to Jesus. The disciple who you love is sick. He's going to die. And then we're told in the text that Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. What do we expect to happen next? Well, I'll tell you what we would do. If someone called us on the phone and someone told us, hey, you know, mom, mom has two weeks to live. I can tell you what we're going to do. We're going to hang up the phone. We're going to get on a plane and we're going to go see mom. That's what we're going to do. Why? Because of love. Because we love our mom. We love our parents, right? Aaron had to do that here recently. When a loved one is on the line, we hang up the phone, we get on a plane, and we go. But here in, in, in John chapter 11 and verse 5, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So, so when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. And this is not how we are, is it? Jesus loved this family, so he stayed two days longer. That is not what Mary or Mar Martha wanted or expected. That's not what they would have done, and that's not what they expected of Jesus. And we see this, by the way, if we jump down to verse 17. If we jump down to verse 17, we're told, it says, Now when Jesus came... He found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, I think there's a reason why John tells us this. Around that time in the ancient world when Jesus was, was walking the earth, around that time, there was this belief that when someone died, their soul sort of hovered around the body for three days. And then after three days, the soul would leave. So the reason why I think John is telling us this, uh, that Lazarus has been in the tomb for four days, is John wants us to see that Lazarus, he's dead. He, he's dead, dead, right? He's really dead. He, he's not coming back. So when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Verse 18, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. So Martha runs out to Jesus. And she says, I expected you to come. I expected you to be here because if you would have been here, then Lazarus wouldn't have died. You see, for Martha, what Martha expected from Jesus was she expected Jesus to stop Lazarus's death. That's what she expected. That's what she wanted. And, I, and, and if we're being honest, if we were living during this time and we knew Jesus, we knew the great physician, and he was one of our close friends and, my, and our brother or mother or whoever it may be was on the verge of death, we would call out to him too. And we would want him here so that he could heal our family. That's what we would do. And so that's what, that's what they expect as well. And we see it from Mary as well. If we jump down to verse 32. Verse 32 of John chapter 11. Now, when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother 
would not have died. So again, Mary and Martha have this expectation, have this desire of Jesus that Jesus does not fulfill. They, they wanted Jesus to come immediately to stop Lazarus' death. And that's not what he does. And we're told that Jesus waited because he loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. But his love isn't what they expected. And that's the lesson for us. Jesus's love isn't always what we expect either. You know, it reminds me of Paul. Paul in the book of 2 Corinthians, you don't have to turn there. You guys can stay in, in, in John chapter 11. But in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul talks about this thorn in his flesh. And there's been a lot of speculation and a lot of debate about exactly what that thorn is. And, you know, I could give you an answer. We don't know. And we're, we're never going to know what that is because we're not told. Right. But there was this thorn in the flesh and he wanted it gone. So this is what the text says. Again, I'll just read it. You don't have to turn there. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he, the Lord said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul says, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Notice here that, that God did love Paul. God loved Paul. But when Paul goes to God and says, hey, can, can you take this thorn away? And Paul expected God to do that. By the way, at least in my opinion, he expected God to do that. Now, there's no other reason to pray for something unless you expect God to, to, to do it, Right. But God says what? He says, no. God loves Paul. But the love wasn't exactly what Paul expected or wanted. And let me ask, has this ever happened to you? Have you ever prayed for something? Prayed to, to the loving God for something? And he says, no. You know, maybe you pray for the loved one to be healed. The loved one facing this terminal illness to be healed. God, please heal. My mother, son, whatever it may be. And then God doesn't do it. And so we think to ourselves, does God love me? Yes, but his love isn't what we expect all the times. Or maybe you've prayed for safety or prayed for God to calm the storm. Like Aaron talked about this morning. But he didn't do it. And so we think in our minds, well, does God love me? Well, of course he does. Again, Sometimes his love just isn't what we expect. So from this story, we see that sometimes we don't receive these things that we want, that we expect from God, because God's love isn't what we expect. God sees things from a different perspective. But even though God's love isn't always what we expect, notice with me at my second point. God's love, Jesus's love, is always what we need. You know, what did Mary and Martha want? They wanted Jesus to stop Lazarus's death. And, and since Jesus loved them, he didn't give them what they wanted. He gave them what they needed. Uh, we see this in, 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 in verse 13 of chapter 11. Verse 13. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he meant uh, taking rest and sleep. So Jesus tells them plainly, no, Lazarus isn't asleep. Lazarus has died. And for your sake... I'm glad that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. So, so we're told here that Lazarus has died, but Jesus is glad. Man, how can that be? How can that be? Well, because through, Lazarus, uh, through the death of Lazarus and this miraculous revel, uh, uh, resurrection, people received what they truly needed. People received faith in Jesus. You see, the point of this sign and it's interesting, in the, in the Gospel of John, they're always called signs. They're not called miracles. And the point is that they're pointing. They're pointing to God. And they're pointing to the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. So the point of this sign was to get other people to believe so that they would ultimately glorify God in heaven. And that's what Jesus says in verse 4, whenever he says, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. So this miracle was this big sign that pointed to God and his glory. Jesus didn't give Mary and Martha what they wanted. 
He gave them what they needed. Through this sign, both Mary and Martha and the disciples have a stronger faith in Jesus. And I think because of that faith, they ultimately have life in Jesus. And so the application for us is, is just that. Jesus may not give us what we want, but he does give us what we need. You know, he, 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 he's looking out for our spiritual well-being. I mean, that's what we saw in, in, in 2 Corinthians, right, with, with regard to Paul. I'm going to just read that again. I'm going to read that again. So, to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh. So, this thorn was given. Paul asked three times for God to take it away. And God says, no, why? To keep me from becoming conceited. God didn't give Paul what he wanted. God gave Paul what he needed. Without that thorn in the flesh, Paul could have become prideful. He could have become boastful. And instead, as we saw from Luke chapter 18, it is the weak and the vulnerable who realize they need God. And so Paul had to go through that. God gave Paul what he needed so that Paul wouldn't become prideful. And the thing is, maybe God's doing the same thing for us. You know, maybe that storm that we asked God to, to, to calm, maybe that's the storm that we need. Maybe that's the storm that's keeping us humble and God can see it. Maybe, maybe we can't see it, but God sees it. Maybe that's what's going on. So Jesus' love, we've learned two things so far from John chapter 11. Jesus' love isn't always what we expect, but it is always what we need. And I think this leads us to, to the next point, and that is Jesus' love provides life. You know, from the beginning, from the very beginning, from, from, from the beginning, we have seen that the problem of this world has been death. You know, if we go back to page one of the Bible in Genesis, page one of the Bible, the world was filled with life. Eden was filled with life. And it was like nothing could stop that life. And as a matter of fact, the life was easy. If man wanted to bring life from the ground, it was easy. He didn't have to toil over it. If woman wanted to bring life from the womb before the, before the fall, it was easy. It wasn't in pain. In Eden, life was easy. And there was no death. So I, on page one of Genesis, there's life. And man is with God in the Garden of Eden. But if you look at the last page of Genesis, the last verse of Genesis, where do we see man? Well, we see Joseph and he's dead. He's in a coffin and he's in Egypt. And if there's anything we know about the Bible, if you read through the Old Testament, is Egypt is never a good place to be. So on page one, we see man filled with life, dwelling with God. The last page in Genesis, we see man dying in a coffin away from God in, in Egypt. Death has been a problem since Genesis, and it has continued throughout the Bible. Uh, Moses, God's righteous servant, he died. Joshua, God's righteous servant, he died. David, God's righteous servant, they all died. And this continued and continued and continued until Jesus and I think that's probably, probably the main point of John chapter 11, that Jesus, he defeats death and he is able to give life. Picking up in verse 21 now, John chapter 11, verse 21, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will arise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. But Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. So Jesus is telling Mary and Martha that he, he, he not only has the power over death, not only have the power to, to offer the resurrection and life, but he is the resurrection and life. And again, that's what Mary, Martha, and the disciples, that's what they needed to hear. But we need, we need to know that as well. That's something that we need to understand as well. One of the biggest problems that you know, we talked about the storms that we face in this life and all of the problems that we face. One of the biggest problems is death, right? And, and we talked about how God doesn't always, he doesn't always give us this detour around our storms. Sometimes we have to go straight through the storms. The same is true of death. 
We don't get this detour around death. We have to go through death. But the thing is, Jesus, or the good news is, Jesus is the resurrection and the life. So Jesus' love provides life. John 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. God loves us. And so he provides life to those who are faithful to him. And that leads us to the final point that we learn in John chapter 11. And that is Jesus's love requires a response. Let's look at verse 25. Verse 25, Jesus is speaking to Martha. He says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? So Jesus tells Martha, hey, I'm the resurrection and the life. Do you believe it? And that's the question that we have to answer as well. Uh, We have seen what Jesus says. Jesus has told us through his word, through the spirit, that he is the resurrection and the life. And he has proven it through, again, through his word, by raising Lazarus from the dead. The question is, do we believe that? You know, there are essentially two responses that we can have to this fact, to to Jesus' love. There are essentially two responses that we can have, and we see it in John chapter 11. Let's, Let's jump down to verse 45, please. Verse 45. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary had seen what he did and believed in him. So that's the first response. The people who saw Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead, some of them believed. That's number one. But, verse 46, but some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. And so uh, some of the people go to the Pharisees, tell Jesus, hey, tells the Pharisees, hey, Jesus has, has raised Lazarus from the dead. And what is their response? We'll jump down to verse 53. Verse 53. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. So some people, whenever they see Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead, they believe. Others, the Pharisees, whenever they see Jesus raise Lazarus or hear about Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead, they say, well, we need to kill the guy with the power over death, ironically, but that's that's their conclusion. Hey, let's, let's kill him. Let's get him out of our hair because he's a problem for us. And that's essentially the two responses that we have as well. We can choose to believe in Jesus based off of what we see in scripture, or we can choose to get rid of Jesus and sort of bury him like the Pharisees did. So how have you responded to Jesus? Let me just ask that in closing. How have you responded? Maybe there's someone who realizes that they've been trying to bury Jesus, trying to get Jesus out of their lives, kill him, so to speak. Can we encourage you to change that? Can we encourage you to to be obedient to Jesus and accepting of his love? If so, we'd love to have you. And the Lord would love to have you because the Lord loves you people. If you need to respond to the invitation, you can come now as we stand and as we sing.